close till I get up. Time is barely on our side. I don't wanna waste what's left. The storms we chase are leading us, and love is all we'll ever trust. Yeah, no, I don't wanna waste what's left. And I Shadow turns to sun rays, and on and on we'll go through the wastelands, through the highways, and on and on we'll go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and hello, Bangkok, and good afternoon, and welcome to the second session of uh, ProPAC Asia's Global Packaging Forums, brought to you by the Australian Institute of Packaging. My name's Ralph Moyle. I'm the Education Coordinator, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, afternoon session with you. I certainly, uh, we had a, uh, an opening session yesterday morning. And I noticed that many of the participants that joined us then are joining us now because these forums flow, ladies and gentlemen, they, they interact between us. And we really do encourage you to be part of all four of them during the course of this week. The topic for this week is uh, this evening rather is uh, how to balance sustainable packaging and food waste targets. Um, oops, not moving, sorry. In format, the slides are not moving. Thank you, thank you. Oi. To those of you who uh, have not met the Australian, thank you. Next slide, please. For those of you in, in Thailand who uh, who haven't come to our previous events at ProPAC Asia, and we've been part of it for many years now, with both forums and a stand, the Australian Institute of Packaging is uh, an independent not-for-profit organization focused on education for packaging technologists. We're not affiliated with any government department and we don't have corporate membership. Next slide, please. This is the challenge that we introduced yesterday in our forum. And this is the real challenge for all packaging technologists is, hey, everyone wants a sustainable packaging and on the left-hand side of that, balance is the Australian 2025 national packaging targets, ladies and gentlemen. But on the other side, are the food waste targets. So where do we put our emphasis? And the course of this evening, we're going to discuss that really difficult balance between the two. So next slide, please. This is statement somewhat self-explanatory, isn't it? You know, it's, it's what packaging does. It's to contain, preserve, protect. 
that's been the way forever and I expect it will remain that way forever. But increasingly, there are more demands put on packaging, the health and safety of the product, the consumers, and clearly the waste that can occur has to be kept to a minimum. And we still have to have efficient packaging that can handle the rigours of the various supply chains, whether it's through the rigours of Thailand or across Australia, it still has to do it with the lowest environmental impact. Next slide, please. As I touched on earlier, these happen to be the, uh, the Australian 2025 national packaging targets, which we discussed in detail yesterday. And as you can see, it, to achieve those targets is, is truly a challenge. And in particular, in the flexible plastics area, where at the moment, We've got a target of 70%, but the in reality, we're, we're down less than 20. So there's a, some massive work to be done in Australia in that area. So do packaging technologists focus in that, or do they have to also consider the food waste? The answer is really both. So let's move on to the next slide, please. We touched on this one to identify what impact a packaging technologist can do to reduce the waste in packaging, okay? This happens to demonstrate information from Australia, which is now, uh, this one's about almost two years old, about to be refreshed. But if you can see the inputs 5.4 million, you can see we're only recovering 2.7. So we still have a massive job to do in Australia into recovering that. So what is as packaging technologists such as yourselves, what can you do about it? Well, there's three key measures there. Well. We just simply don't design it appropriately to, to be recovered, one key step. A third of it is lost, which just it's not collected. That's either litter or consumers put the, the packaging item in the wrong place for it to be recovered. And then there's the actual recovery process itself, making sure that the packaging is designed to work with the sorting facilities that gather our waste and sort it out into the various formats for recycling. So in that area, there's a massive job for packaging technologists to do. Next slide. One of the aspects that we've implemented here in Australia is the sustainable packaging guidelines, which were issued by the Australian Packaging Covenant. There are 10 key areas to be addressed and there's a lot of detail in behind them, but it is a very effective checklist for packaging technologists to, to work with in their own environment, in their own uh, materials, processing, consumers and whatever. This approach covers all of that. So it's a very practical, pragmatic approach. It can take some time to work through, but that's what's required to resolve these issues and improve our situation as far as sustainable packaging is concerned. Next slide, if you will. Here's just five key aspects out of that strategy that in just the most simplest high level, you can reduce the packaging through design and innovation or light weighting or choose a different material or, hey, guess what? Reuse the packaging. The strategy 1.2 is phase out problematic and unnecessary single use. So there's a lot of that going on now and in, in our circumstances in Australia, state governments are in fact legislating that. So the impact if packaging businesses aren't willing to do it themselves or FMCGs not willing to, the governments are now stepping in and most of those experiences have never been that successful, but they do reinforce what the consumer is looking for. Increase the proportion of reusable packaging that will be discussed later in this session and certainly the design for materials recycling will also be touched on. Compostability is, is an interesting and somewhat emotive topic. And I think the, my keywords are where it's appropriate. And at this point in time, uh, there's some limitations certainly in the Australian environment. If you could move on, please. Back to that. So here we are, guys, we've got We've discussed the, the packaging side of this and the, the challenges we need to address. Now the other side of the balance in the food waste. So let's move into that, that section of the introduction. Next slide, please. So in, in certainly from an Australian perspective, this is the targets the governments have issued us. We have to halve food waste 
by 2030. Yeah, I know it's we're 2010 now, and yeah, it seems like a long, long distance off, but the target is massive, and I'll quantify that in a minute. So here's the other side of the balance that we've got to consider. Next slide, please. That's the kind of tonnage we're talking about by 2030. That's a massive amount of tonnage of food. The breakdown in the columns indicates where that wastage is coming from. Yes, there are issues at the farm in the primary production. There are some modest ones through manufacturing, retail, hospitality and others. But the other significant column of where wastage occurs is in the home. Good hard earned money gone to spend on beautiful wholesome food and guess what? doesn't get eaten, just put, gets put in the waste bin. No nutrition, no value out of it. So loss, loss, loss for families who really do need to think more carefully about it. So we have some issues. This just indicates where a lot of that work's got to be done. Next slide, if you will. Here's part of the breakdown in the financial terms, 20 billion Australian dollars. I recall correctly, we're talking about 20 baht to the dollar. So 400 billion baht is a significant amount of waste in financial terms alone, without the social and all the health aspects of it. A significant target we have to address. Next slide, please. Here's a delightful lady. Her name's Roby Khan and she runs an organization of food recovery here in Australia, an admirable uh, occupation and task that she performs. She's got a lot of food around her. So what does that represent, ladies and gentlemen? It, what you've got in front of you is 298 kilograms of food. That's what the average Australian person wastes every year. And it's not a target or anything that I speak to you about with any pride whatsoever, but this brings it into reality of how much that really looks like. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the, here's the key message on the other side of the balance, ladies and gentlemen. That packaging, food packaging has got to minimise or prevent food waste all the way through from paddock, all the way through to plate, you've got design, you've got protect, you've got a lot of targets to do. And at the same time, guess what? We're back to that balance. We've still got to be sustainable. I think the short story here for packaging technologists is you're gonna be busy for the next few years. Okay, next slide, please. And who better to talk about in great new designs, but our own Nerida Kelton. So Nerida, can I hand over to you now, please, to take us through some really creative, award-winning designs in, in food packaging? Thank you, Ralph. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some best practice examples of sustainable packaging um, and also safe food packaging, because they are slightly different when, when you're looking at them from a design aspect. So here is the gold winner of the World Star Awards. So the World Star Awards are run by the World Packaging Organization. They're an annual awards program, and they take all of the winners from around the world. And there are about 70 odd countries around the world that are a part of this program. And they judge them on a global perspective. The gold winner was actually a Australia and New Zealand partnership and it was the first Australasian uh, dairy creamery that actually moved a glass bottle um, into a PCR, so a post-consumer recycled content. They tried to maintain the look and feel of glass as you can see. So from a consumer perspective, aesthetically, it looks like glass, but it was fully recyclable, recycled content. And as you can see from the right-hand side of the screen, there were significant savings in terms of trees, water, um, reductions of plastic, and also savings in water. They saved about 340 tonnes of virgin plastic simply by moving to the recycled content. Next slide, please. 
This silver winner also happens to be from Australia and we were very lucky this year to have such remarkable innovations being recognised recognize globally. This is a bakery range of our largest retailer in Australia. They replaced the non-recyclable black trays with a fibre-based tray, um, unbleached bamboo and sugarcane tray. And one of the significant um, achievements of this was they reduced plastic by 265 tonnes a year. It is also certified home compostable by the Australasian Bioplastics Association. And it also has the Australasian recycling label on pack for consumers to clearly, intuitively and easily understand what they do with the label, what they do with the top and what they do, what they do with the tray and how to recycle it in the appropriate bins. Next, next slide, please. The bronze winner for globally was Yasa packaging from the Netherlands. And this one is to replace the plastic bags for, um, for potatoes, but there's also an option for onions, nuts, seeds, and bulbs. It can be closed without sealing. It has a self-adhesive system and the paper is fully recyclable. So it's one material being used for the entire pack and it's completely recyclable in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we've been working on, and it's a, a local program that we are going to roll out globally, and we would encourage all of the packaging designers and technologists around the world to use these guidelines, is to come up with some guidelines when you're designing safe food packaging. Because safe food packaging can actually be in conflict occasionally with the 2025 national packaging targets. So what we've tried to do is come up with five sets of criteria that you can use to consider when you're designing your packaging to minimize food waste wherever possible within your design. So we start by looking at spoilage and damage through manufacture warehouse and all areas of distribution. And that can include things like shock, vibration, temperature, moisture, and also things like palletization, stabilization. Um, we also look at preserving, enhancing product appeal and extending shelf life. And anybody that's listening that, uh, that already designs food packaging understands that extension and barrier and shelf life are critical for food for, and particularly for food packaging. What we are trying to encourage people to do is to consider moving to more um, skin packaging, more MAP, EMAP packaging, and actually looking at that for extension and barrier so that we aren't wasting food. And the other thing that we really encourage all of you to do is start looking at active and intelligent packaging. And this is an area that not too many packaging technologists are currently using within their design. And Michael will talk to this in far more detail shortly. But look at active and intelligent packaging and try and actually start incorporating it. And also consider things like resealable options and openability. Um, and there's so many things that you can do in extension and shelf life and barrier that can actually pre prevent and minimize food waste along the supply chain. Next slide, please. Then we also look at convenience to not waste food in handling. And this is where we're really talking about inclusive and accessible design. So, and also small portion control, consumer convenience, easy opening and easy resealable. And I'll show you some examples of this shortly. The next one is about storage and usage, recipes, leftovers, explaining to people um, what they can do with their leftovers, how they can cook it, giving them some ideas for recipes and clear and self-explanatory best before and use by dates that actually are consistent across all categories so that consumers can easily pick up any type of packaging, any type of product and understand the differences between best before and use by and not be confused by what they mean. Um, and then obviously the final one, which we've touched on, which is a very important balance we need to meet, is to make sure that you are adhering to all of your global and local sustainable packaging design targets. Next slide, please. So what does this look like? This is what it looks like. So this is the World Star Gold winner for um, Safe Food Packaging Design Special Award this year. And what stands out on this pack is that it was actually designed for a smaller household. So for two people, 
not for four, not for six. So it was designed because our households are actually getting smaller overall. And it was designed so you're not wasting food, you're not buying too much and not using it. So two people, easy to open, easy peelable option on the top right hand corner. It's freezer ready, it extends shelf life and it's great portion control servings. Next slide, please. This is the Silver Winner globally, and this is out of China. And um, uh, this is designed for a particular region in China. And it's to encourage people to have a reusable, sustainable and recyclable egg carton for want of a better term. And you can actually make it modular. You can actually add um, layers to it. If you have um, more than, I think the average for a week is about 40 eggs per, per household in this region for, for egg usage. So it's a very flexible modular option and it's recyclable. Next slide, please. The bronze winner globally was Playpon out of America. And this one is small portion. It has, it's, it's leak proof, so it's leak preventative. It has vented and non-vented options. It's reusable, it's recyclable. You can use it for leftovers. And they've made sure that the top, the lid and the container are both the same material. So it's fully recyclable in the curbside. Next slide, please. And I'm going to hand over to Ralph to introduce Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derrida. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, before I hand it over to the magnificent Michael Dosser, I really want to remind you, please take note of questions that you would like to ask the panelists once their presentations are finished. I think there's a whole lot more uh, development that you can get out of this material by asking pertinent questions. Like for example, Nerida had some brilliant designs there that were both sustainable and save food. So let's uh, think of the questions as you go forward because uh, Michael's presentation is excellent. I'm sure you have some wonderful questions for him. Michael, can I now hand over to you, please? Yep, no problems. Thank you very much. Lovely to see everybody that I can't see. And it's not very often that I get called introduced magnificent. So I'm going to roll with that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you um, very much for indulging and listening to me. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things. I've got a couple of case studies to go through the link, the topic um, uh, as far as food waste and sustainability is concerned. Um, those two case studies, um, this first one here is in, in fresh produce and the second one is in bakery. They're two products that I would consider to be quite fragile. And when I say fragile, I mean fragile and susceptible to food waste more in the home than anything else. Um, so then I'll work, work, move on and talk about a couple of emerging technologies, um, labels being one of those. And I think the first thing that pops into your mind there is labels. How is that an emerging technology? Watch this space. I'll show you how that is becoming a, a, a reality. Um, and also then the next part of the presentation, we'll go into a, a bit of an overview on, uh, on one of the products that we work with in the active, intelligent, active and intelligent packaging space which is an extremely exciting area that Nerida highlighted earlier on. So product number one here in the first slide is a, a, a pack that we were um, in, involved in the development of for a, a fresh produce product called Grape and Go. This is quite a unique product in, uh, in the Australian market. Um, and there's uh, rumors that this might be exported. So who knows, you might see it uh, throughout the Asia Pacific region. Um, Grape and Go is a, a washed, grape it's de-stemmed and it's ready to eat so when you have a, a grape and you put it through those things it becomes even more fragile and more susceptible to damage um, what we did was we looked at that product and we we developed a, a, a pack that's a, it's a punnet it's a PET punnet and then we developed a, a resealable lidding film um, that is also PET so we're talking about a product that is 100% PET um, we then looked at how do we actually get that functionality to look at it from a food safe perspective um, or safe food perspective, sorry. Key criteria there was the resealability. Although it's a small, it's a, it's a small pack, um, it still needed to be designed in a way that it was able to be used as a grazing option for consumers. So what the research showed is a lot of people were buying this product, popping it on their desk and they might eat a grape, close it up, 
leave it for a little while, have another one. So it might, it, it increased the, the use of the product. We also looked at the supply chain and how we could um, prolong the, the life of the product. Um, and by using um, what we call uh, environmental modified atmosphere packaging, um, by using the natural properties of, um, and the, of the product itself, we we're actually able to set up the packaging so the respirations of the fruit were extended and thus the shelf life was extended. If I go to the next slide, please. So in, in, in summary there, you've got a, a really funky looking pack that's been designed to be held in the hand easily by the consumer, thus the curved top. Um, as I mentioned, the 100% PET construction, making it uh, Australian recycled and labeling curbside collector recyclable. Um, the environmental um, modified atmosphere packaging, um, aiding to the extension of the shelf life of the product. Um, but then some practical things as well. Um, you know, it's a product and it's fresh produce. So a nice big clear window using the PET is a very, a, a very uh, product, uh, something that enables us to play, display the product in a very, very vivid nature. Um, looking at the, the, the portion control there, as I say, reseal on a 150 gram pack. Um, may, some people may think that to be too small to have a reseal function, but when you look at the, the, the purpose of the pack as that grazing option. Um, and we were actually telling the consumers that, uh, that they could reseal that. Um, we were lucky enough to win some, uh, some, some Peter Awards, the Australian Institute of Packaging Awards, um, and also some marketing awards for this product in Australia as well. So something that we're really proud of. Um, if I could go to the next slide, please. So this is a, a project that uh, that we worked on in the bakery sector with uh, with Mission Foods um, uh, on their on their on their tortillas. This is a, a product that we've worked with for many years now. And this is a connection between um, a, a product that uh, de developed by a company in the US called Seal Strip. It's called Fresh Pack, and essentially what we're doing is using an adhesive based tape as the reseal. Um, mechanism for the pack itself. So it's a move away from the zipper and I'll talk about the importance of that in a, in a minute. Um, but essentially what we're able to do is use adhesive soft um, acrylic based adhesives on the pack um, integrated into the flow wrapper of the machine. So it's, it's the flow wrap, the horizontal or could be a vertical flow wrapper where we integrate a piece of mechanical kit. Um, it's not limited to any one type of um, flow wrapper. So you have a neutral model. It's not, doesn't require massive upgrades to capital equipment. If you're using a flow wrapper at the moment, it can be adapted to any time. Um, and we actually slit the film. And if you look closely there, you can see there's a wave cut there. That's a tamper evident feature. So when the pack is opened up, it's very difficult. It's almost impossible. It actually is impossible um, to lay it back down again. Um, but we're able to utilize and specify the tape so that we're actually able to still maintain the barrier properties required in a very fragile product being a, a bakery based product. Um, so all about being able to protect the product, maintain the, um, the, the freshness, um, and you know, as we say, they're being good to the last bite. If we can go to the next slide, please. When we look at the sustainability benefits of this pack, this is where we do a, a comparison between a zip style reclose and, and a resealable tape style reclose. Probably two key factors there. There's some, some big claims. The use of tapes reduces the amount of plastics in the pack by 60%. Put quite frankly, there's no, there's no bulky plastic zipper. It's actually a very low file, low profile tape. The other benefit is with a zipper, you actually need quite a lot of head space there. So you can see at the top and the bottom of that pack um, on the uh, on the left hand side that you've got uh, a lot of head space or a lot of clear space in the packaging to accommodate the zipper. Because on with the resealable tape, we move over to the side of the pack, we're actually able to open it. We don't need to have all that head space and we still get the same level of functionality. We'll go to the next slide, please. This is where I talk about label materials and emerging technologies. Um, and you know, the, again, the first thing that everybody says is labels are labels are not new, um, but they have a massively important role to play in both sustainability um, and also also food waste control. 
number one, they communicate a lot of things on a lot of packs. A lot of the samples, examples that Nerida showed you there had labels on them in some way, shape or form. So with the, the label materials, we break it up into three criteria. The first one being recycle um, type materials, the second one being reduce, and the third one being renew. Terms that packaging technologists have been hearing for a long time. So trying to align with the key, the key R's that we call them. Um, let's look at the recyclable stuff um, product cycle uh, product types first. Compostable label stocks. These are now available um, and, 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 and are now being widely used in Europe. As Ralph touched on earlier, compostability is a, is a, can be a touchy subject because it relies on sometimes industrial composting, something that we don't have in Australia. But what we are seeing further beyond just FSC certification, we're actually seeing materials and face stocks of labels made out of 100% recycled paper, even 100% recycled post-consumer PE materials. Um, one of the biggest growth areas in this space is wash-off adhesives being used, and I'll talk a, a little bit about that in, uh, in my next slide, but this is a massive area of opportunity to not only use the label to communicate key things to the consumer and of the brand and the benefits of the product, but also aid in the recyclability of that product. Um, and uh, and yeah, when we talk about the recyclability and the, the wash off adhesives, we're going to, to talk about one particular product, which is a, a world first, which is a, a wash off for all three main types of packaging, um, polypropylene, polyethylene and PET. The reduce, the most significant advantage that we're seeing in this industry is the, um, the removal of the release liner. Um, there's a whole range of technologies in this space. Um, we work with one uh, Ravenwood in the, um, in the primary packaging identification and early next year through our work with Herma, we're about to launch a linerless solution for carton labeling as well. Um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then when we start to talk about the, oh, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, the last one there, which is Renew. Um, one of the more innovative products is, is label stocks made from alternative materials. So instead of having um, just paper, we actually now have grass paper. So if we could go to the next slide. So these are the, 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 the three R's again, but let's drilling down on a, some particular products within that range. This particular adhesive um, that we've just launched in Australia, which is getting a lot of, uh, a lot of interest is, um, is a wash off adhesive um, that applies and behaves normally through the cycle. So it applies like any permanent adhesive onto a polypropylene, polyethylene or PET container. And then what it's designed to do, it's a multi-layer adhesive. So what it's designed to do is when the product goes through the, 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 the recycling process and, and gets to the plastics recycler, the first thing they do is chop it up and they put it through a washing process. This adhesive is designed to remove from the PET container or the polypropylene container at that point. We're actually seeing results um, through testing that we're doing in Australia at the moment and sustainable long-term use in Europe, where that wash-off is very, very close to 100%. The benefit there is we're increasing the amount of material that's being reclaimed and reducing the, the, the losses in the recycling process. The next one is the innovation of the, what we call the Inno liner, no liner. Um, this is a, a linerless labeling technology. So we're talking about a self-adhesive technology that is um, activated, not um, adhesive based. So we actually, in this particular case, we actually hit the adhesive layer with a small mist of water um, that causes the adhesive to get its tack instantly. Um, and then when it's applied to the product, it is actually, it's actually a permanent, permanent bond. Um, very innovative technology as far as alignless is concerned and one of the biggest growth areas that I think we'll see. There are some capital equipment, is some capital equipment associated with it. Um, but a, a very, very innovative area and a very strong way to be able to deliver some, um, some on sustainability targets. The last one, which I touched on briefly there is a, a picture of the, of the grass paper. Primarily it's being used with products that where consumer or brands are looking for that organic feel because it does have the color to it. Um, but a, but it's a, a product that's made out of a 30% grass. Um, so we're, we're looking at alternative materials in those stocks. 
Next slide, please. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, active and intelligent packaging. And what is active and intelligent packaging? You can see the QR code up in the top corner. Um, I think the audience now um, is very familiar with what a, a QR code is. It's only one mechanism for communicating. Um, we're seeing the emergence of RFID to NFC and the use of mobile phones as a trigger point. So essentially what we're talking about with active and intelligent packaging, in this case, our Everything Product Cloud, is putting an active digital identity on every product that is produced, a unique identifier. In this particular case, let's call it a unique code, a unique QR code. This, this identifier enables the consumer, the supply chain, the brand owner, to activate and, integ and, and interact with each individual product and share amazing individualized content. This is a most incredible area. When we apply this to supply chain movements, it enables us to track what products are really doing in real time. We're talking about a cloud-based solution that enables us to, um, how do I say this, um, uh, track the data and even use machine learning to predict where products might go. Um, and then from a consumer perspective, it enables the consumer to interact and get information on the product. We all know that the brand and the, the um, amount of space on a, on a pack is, is, is prime real estate. So by doing this and using the mobile devices that we have, it's all web deployed, so it's not reliant on an app or it can be app based. We're able to share things like brand and, and, and brand content and information, alerts on an expiry date, um, and then also talk about the sustainability ingredient and benefits of a product or the sustainability of the ingredients of the product. The communication mechanism behind this are endless. Um, it's a crazy technology. If we could go to the, ne the next and my last slide, please. So these are a couple of case, a case studies of where this is being where this is being being used. The first one um, with a major retailer that um, I'm sure throughout the Asia Pacific region you're quite familiar with. Um, this one is to actually encourage recycling. So what the, the there's an NFC or a, a QR code placed on, on a bunch of a range of, of products, um, and when the consumer actually put those through the recycling process, they actually um, get points. Um, the next one is um, is the largest salmon producer in the world, which has uh, got a, a QR code based technology that's enabling them, the consumers to understand exactly what the farming patterns and routines were of that salmon. So a, a massive authenticity um, piece. And the last one is there for, with Unilever using, using the active and intelligent packaging to deliver really unique content on the benefits of a refillable pack. Um, they're just three examples of many, many, many that are going on around the world. So hopefully what I've been able to do there is, is throw some stuff at you that might be thought provoking. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, that was really good, Michael. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I've got a question for you later on on track and traceability with the QR code. So just be prepared for that one. Okay, I'll be ready so, for it. So ladies and gentlemen, as I painted the picture at the start there about that real challenge between sustainable packaging on one side and, and fighting food waste in the other. I think as you've seen already from Nerida's presentation and then from Michael's, that there is some truly creative work out there that does meet both goals. And as I think you'd be impressed, there's some co very commercially successful products there as well. So. It's good to be sustainable. It's good to fight food waste, but there's nothing wrong with making money at the same time and really meeting all the consumer's needs. So let's move on to, to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Warwick Armstrong has been with Plantic for, and the driving force behind that business for, for quite a long time. I won't count as how long it is, Warwick. I won't embarrass both of us with that. But ladies and gentlemen, Plantic is quite a unique packaging material for the market. And uh, Warwick, I'm really looking forward to the next 10 minutes of your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. Um, next slide, please, on the start. So I'm just going to touch on today um, a bit about us and uh, Plantech Technologies here based in Australia and uh, what we're trying to achieve and what we are achieving 
around the globe and um, and those um, situations that we've already touched on by Ralph and Michael and Nerida. So um, global issues, as we know, there's roughly a thousand tonnes of food wasted every minute. Now you can you can find this data on the internet. It's very available, and you know, as Plantic is a member of the Carraro Group, who is the largest EVOH supplier in the world. It's, it's on the top of our um, list to make sure our barrier packaging is of high quality and you know, we're, we're saving that, that food wastage as best we can. And if you look at that number of 35%, it's coming from that um, supermarket shops and households. There's obviously other areas, you know, um, carrots being the wrong size and different things like that. But, you know, we, we try and touch on what we control and um, let other people control their part as well. Plastic pollution, as we know, um, again, estimated at, at that 8 million tonnes of plastic enters the ocean every year. A um, couple of examples, um, the Sova Beach near Mumbai, you know, they, they yielded a, a three kilometre stretch and they estimated it was around 12,000 tonnes of plastic waste. They did an excellent job, don't get me wrong, of tidying this up, cleaning it up. But, you know, again, prevention is better than cure. So we, we like to, we're going to try and um, focus on prevention rather than um, going to this, this um, extremes of um, tidying up these wastes. And I remember back um, two pro packs ago, I was sitting in my motel and, and even in Thailand, it, it, it became highlighted in 2018 that on the uh, Songkla province, you, we had a whale that actually had swallowed 80 plastic bags. And it was becoming a bit of a talking point at the exhibition um, on those days. And it was so, no one's immune to this. It's, it's a real issue. Again, we're about prevention um, rather than the cure. Um, and plastic reduction. So at Plantic, um, we're a, a plant-based material, um, plant-based high barium material. Um, we're doing other things, which I'll touch on in the next slide or so, but we're reducing that reliance on, on the uh, fossil fuel based, the virgin plastics. Um, we're trying to reduce that reliance on that and bring those um, uh, version plastics down as much as possible in the in the finished pack. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to touch on a couple of award-winning um, packs that we've done. Um, the first thing I will say is our when we design our materials, we always go for the function first. So we know that the material has a function, and you know it's a real balancing act between the function and the environmental side. Or the sustainability side, the recyclability side. Um, most of our consumers or most of our customers globally are very aware of the sustainability side and everything. They want the best sustainability side, but if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. So with that in mind, all of our materials, which we have a, a lot of materials nowadays, uh, near 30, so different structures and different things, um, we realise that the function comes first. So Plantic um, itself is a high barrier plant-based polymer. And because we use such a thick component in the finished structure, up to 150, 200 micron, we, we're finding that barrier gives us um, an excellent um, extension of shelf life. Those people that, that know that um, have, and have tested our materials are proof. We um, normally leave that up to the customer to um, do those tests on their own. Um, as you know, shelf life has a start and a finishing point. Um, but if we can take it past the finishing point, then that's what we try and do. Um, back probably two years ago, we decided with the new regulations coming out that we had to have a percentage of recycled content that we'd start to use recycled PET in the pack. So if you look at the um, slogan on the right, you know, we use plastic that others throw away and we grow the rest, that's completely true. So we're now taking recycled content from um, the PET post-consumer recycling stream. We're adding that into the pack. Um, and that's giving us, you know, an almost 93% um, 
sometimes a bit higher, um, of no new plastics. So I think that's, that's a great technology, what the guys have done for our team here, and it's now going elsewhere. One of the other benefits of the plastic material that being a multi-layer structure is it's now recyclable. So during the recycling stream, it gets identified as a PET. Um, when it gets ground down, because Plantec is not only home compostable, but water soluble, it washes away um, and it ends up, you got the, um, the finished PET polymers that are ready to go and ready to be recycled again. So like we said, with, it's, it's a world, world star a winning pack and a President's Award winning, which we're extremely proud of. Um, the first time for someone in Australia to win that. So we're very proud of this pack and it's, it's serving us well. Next slide, please. So what else uh, we do is um, full home compostable solutions or compostable solutions. And like both the guys previous touched on, you know, there's home compostable and there's industrial compostable. Very good to understand um, your, your um, market, your home market to see who can take what and, and can you do home compostable, can you do um, industrial compostable. One item where we do get asked a lot is from a lot of uh, big brand owners who don't like to see their name on the beach and on the side of the road. Um, so that's where some of these home compostable solutions come in and they're quite, they're quite um, handy for us and they're quite gaining a little bit of momentum, I would say, in the marketplace. But I would say this, that, you know, uh, you go back to the first point where plastic has a, um, a function first. I often amaze me when people say, oh, no, we're going to go down the recycling route or we're going to go down the compost compostable um, route. If I, if I employ everyone to look at both solutions, both have major benefits and both can be um, used in the supermarket. It all depends on the product that's being packed. So for us, um, you know, we started with um, the mono layer there, which you can see is the blue tray. That's the mono layer plantic. And, you know, 14 years ago, we had this uh, material designed and Cadbury was one of our first customers who used it in their chocolate tray. And I think it's, it's a great product. It, it, decomp it um, composts in 11 days, but unfortunately it's no good for packing anything pretty much other than chocolates, to be honest. So then we, we, we combine it with other materials or other compostable materials such as um, PBS and papers and other, and other different um, solutions to give us, um, for example, the coffee bag there on the right-hand side um, is was a, a world star winner and we're now doing other pouches going into vertical machines vertical pouches and other different areas where we we see compostable as a um, as a um, solution once again that's a that's something a little bit unique in the world a high barrier paper which can be recycled in the paper stream um, next slide please and last slide so for us, um, we understand, and I'm sure everyone on the on the uh, web understands that consumers are demanding more sustainable solutions. We know that um, global governments are driving changes um, through legislations around plastics. Um, we know leading companies have packaging strategies with key goals. Retailers have announced, you know, clear directions around plastics. We haven't found anyone globally to say to us, hey, I'm not going to do anything. Everyone's doing something, everyone's driving, everyone's looking for something different. You know, I hope, you know, from, a, from our point of view, and I think it's um, a great solution, you know, we're saving food with high barrier, which is, it comes to saving food, you know, plastic um, pollution, which is which, which is worse. Um, we're reducing that reliance on the virgin plastics, so we're trying to cut down as much as possible um, to, to get rid of that, that um, source. Try, we're trying to find a, an avenue, I would say, for um, recycled plastics, because I think if we create an avenue for it, 
you encourage more people to actually recycle and you encourage the recyclers to take more care if they've got somewhere to um, sell their, their materials. We're sourcing our materials from renewable and sustainable source. Um, yes, that's correct. You know, the plant or the starch based um, product, the plantic monolayer uh, with the high barriers sourced from the starch. Um, starch is used in a lot of things, you know, like paints and glues and cardboards and papers and number of different things. And we just happen to take ours and, and use it for plastics. We're sourcing materials post-consumer recycle, which as I said, um, you know, we're taking the recycling, providing that avenue. Attacking the war on plastic, we're trying to use as middle as um, at least the virgin plastics as possible. And, you know, through independent LCAs, which we're quite happy to provide, um, we know that we're better for the environment and reducing um, our CO2 emissions because of the, the plant-based structure. So that's all from me. Um, any questions or uh, those type of things, please reach out and uh, let me know. Oh, Thanks, that's well. fantastic. Thank you very much, Warwick. That, that last slide's really powerful and, and I think very challenging to all of us as you go through each of those lines and points that you've raised there. So you certainly haven't missed the, missed the target there. Warwick, thank you very much. Thanks, Ralph. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would please use the Q&A box uh, as the presenters go on. Uh, Alan's got a great presentation coming up and the orders of uh, that you put the questions up is where I'm gonna start. So the, it's literally is the first in best dressed and David Alcade, your question will certainly be the first one asked to the panel because you were the first one to post. So please keep those questions coming. Alan's got a great presentation, so I'm, if this will really will provoke a, a lot of questions from you, ladies and gentlemen. Alan Adams represents Sealed Air. He's got a great background in this area, and I'm really looking forward to his presentation. Over to you, Alan. Alan, could you come off mute, please? Thank now we you. Got you. Now we got you. That's good. And uh, yeah, hopefully there we, there I am. Thanks, Ralph. Um, really appreciate the invite to come along and talk to you this afternoon uh, about this really interesting space and kind of critical challenge for the world, really, the balancing of food waste and, uh, and, and outcomes for our environment. And perhaps as an organisation, uh, you know, this is very near and dear to the hearts of the organisation I work for uh, at Cryovac brand packaging at sealed air. If you could move me on to the next slide, please, that would be great. So what I want to do is talk you through some tools and thought processes that might help work out what strategies might suit you to work through how do you make a determination on what's the right strategy and path. And certainly, Michael, Warwick and Nerida have all talked quite a bit about how important form and function really is in packaging. And it still is probably the, the most primary uh, factor we need to consider. So looking at the topic today, food waste versus packaging waste, Ralph started out talking about this as being a balanced view. And really, it absolutely is. And we have the, this area that we need to think about in terms of what are the outcomes we want in when we are balancing up the thinking around food waste and the thinking around packaging waste. And we see that distilling down into two core areas. So packaging waste, recovery of materials, reuse of materials is a lot about a circular view. How do we continue to keep the value of these very important and high value resources that are embedded in the packaging that we make and supply? And at the same time, we've got to make decisions about what is our environmental footprint? How are we impacting climate change? And a great measure of climate change is really carbon footprint, an all encompassing measure of what it is that our sphere of influence is doing. And interestingly, it is a balance because in packaging choices, often there is a tension between 
circularity and carbon footprint. So how do we make the right decisions? Well, let's explore some of those spaces. First off, a really interesting fact around why the function of the packaging is probably the number one criteria is because when we look at the space of food packaging, the value of what we're wrapping is just so high. There's a lot of embedded resources in growing, producing the food, getting it through the supply chain, into retail, into our homes, and to be a great eating experience. So some statistics that might be quite surprising is that, for example, cheese can have 76 times the carbon footprint in generation of the cheese versus the packaging that wraps that cheese. And perhaps the strongest example is beef. Fresh ground beef or a fresh steak, beautiful meat we all love to enjoy, can have as much as a 360 times carbon footprint for growing that amazing steak and beef that we enjoy versus the shrink bag that's used to protect it. So you can see that even a very small amount of food waste will quickly outweigh the packaging in terms of when we are balancing the cost of performance and environmental impact. So taking into account our environment, our economy and society, we just cannot afford to continue to waste food at the rates that we are. And it, it can be up to 40% of edible food grown being wasted. Just when, I when you think about the context of the weight of that in terms of environmental impact versus what we're doing with packaging, you can see where I'm going with this. We've got to get great outcomes for the packaging at end of life, absolutely, and recover packaging and build it into circular outcomes. But at the same time, we absolutely have to try and reduce food waste with our packaging design. So we want circularity, we want packaging recovery, but we can't afford unintended consequences of continuing to, to increase food waste or not take the very best opportunities to reduce food waste that we have. We have to design not only for supply chain losses, but increasingly, and I think you heard Warwick and, uh, and Ralph and Nerida talk about this, household, design for households and use in households is critical as well. And perhaps in this era, this year of COVID-19, we were eating at home far more, perhaps to many of us, that is even more important uh, than ever before. You know, how do we deal with food in our homes and how do we ensure we are not wasting it at home? Thank you, next slide, please. So some models and tools to help the thinking here. The waste hierarchy is an age old tool describing what the importance and relative choice hierarchy we should go through is when it comes to evaluating many things, including waste, food waste, and packaging design. So when we're designing what sort of packaging to choose, as packaging designers and brand owners, it's really important to know your cradle to grave. Know the whole area that we're operating in and designing for. We need to understand what the resource impacts are in manufacturing, what the impacts are up and down the supply chain, and what the impacts are in homes, things like storage, how foods will be cooked, how is the package accessed, can we get all of the contents out of the package easily? Portion sizes. Nerida mentioned a pack, which, which we're very proud of at Sealed Air because it's one of ours, and um, with the Bear Bird Chicken um, World Star Award winning pack. Portion size and that application was one of the key reasons it was a key winner in driving down food waste. We also th need to think about what infrastructure is coming towards us. With all of these things in mind, the waste hierarchy still stacks up as a model that's very useful. From a climate change perspective and a total packaging consumption and packaging impacts on the environment perspective, reduce is still the number one option. How do we use less and how do we waste less? 
reuse is a model that's coming up in our space of fresh food and where a lot of food is wasted, the highest levels of food waste exist, reuse models are more challenging. And then recycling, how do we recycle? And recycling is not just sitting still. We've got advanced recycling methods coming through that can recover high performance, thin technology packaging materials. And this is critical because it's high performance, thin technology materials that minimize resource use and deliver the shelf life, the protection and the food waste reductions that we need. So it is a balancing act to achieve the desired result with less, less resources, less packaging weight, and at the same time, less damage and losses. Next slide, please. So many of you might be thinking, okay, so what am I aiming at here? And here's a, a quick look of some different views and why it can be confusing in making choices around circularity for design and what sustainable packaging means. One approach is a scientific approach to survey what is the minimum environmental impact of a particular supply situation, a particular food running through a specific supply chain and a particular packaging type. We can define that and we can work out what the scientific answer is. But that isn't necessarily what is always chosen. Quite surprising. Why is that? Well, there's two other really important categories that come into play here. One is consumer perspective. What do consumers think? What are they looking for? And they are heavily influenced by media and sometimes even by government direction. Minimum environmental impact can often suggest that using the lightest weight packaging is important. And circularity can have a cost if our infrastructure and our scale is not present. So these are factors we need to think about in designing and we need to support the development of those circular programs. And then of course, we've got cost and fit for purpose. Does it do the job? And can we afford to pay for this packaging? So I'd encourage everyone to have a think about it. When we're choosing how we design our packaging, are we designing for consumer sentiment or environmental impact? And how closely aligned are those two objectives? They're not always as close as we might think. So to that point, I think it's really important that as brand owners and packaging manufacturers, we continue the journey of educating consumers about packaging, what its impact is and what it does for us. So we're really big supporters of this idea that, can, that educating on pack is important. And you can see the little icon here talking about extending shelf life or up to five times longer uh, survival of whatever the pack is. Consumers all too often are not told why the packaging is the way it is. And it's really important to do so. And I think there is marketing opportunity here Edu educating consumers on the packaging's capability and what it does for them has really great potential. Next slide, please. When we're thinking about design, balancing timing is important. We need to think about where we are today and what it is that the environment or the life cycle this packaging we're choosing is going to go through. So being clear on what infrastructure is available today, things like have been talked about in some of the other uh, presentations like compostable. Do we have access to the infrastructure to recover that material? If we don't today, is that a good outcome? These are things to weigh into decisions. So thinking about what infrastructure do we have today and what infrastructure are we supporting coming towards us or are we supporting the development of? We need to be designing for what is there today, but also what is likely coming towards us. Without a clear program or path to infrastructure for recovery, choosing a particular type of packaging will be more about what its functionality is than what its end of life outcome can be. So we need to be aware of all of that to make the best choices, reduce the food waste 
and deliver the good outcome in terms of circularity or recovery of packaging, minimizing the impact on the environment, if you like. I think standing still is not where we can be. So we need to, you, you should be pressing us. I'm a representative of the packaging industry. You should be pressing us for innovation that enables materials to be recovered and also deliver those food waste outcomes. And the industry is not standing still. So continue to drive for those great outcomes. Next slide, please. As a dramatic ex uh, example of how thinking about the entire supply chain can have a major impact on food waste, I wanted to pick out this specific example. And it happens to be from New Zealand. Through a great project, the avocado industry in New Zealand was able to make a, a tremendous impact on food waste. And it's not necessarily where you might think it would normally be. It's not the, the area that we typically think about as we're designing. So in this project, the avocado industry came to us and at Sealed Air, we designed an ultra high barrier material that would stop oxygen getting through to avocado paste. If you know avocados, you know that any oxygen discolors the product very quickly. And that in combination with cold, high pressure pasteurization generated an outcome where we created a stable avocado paste, I might call that guacamole, that would be available with a shelf life of over 90 days, shifting out from less than 30 to over 90 days. And it is quite close to 120 days today. So a major extension in shelf life. The not always seen benefit of this is that it created access to new markets, enabled export to wider destinations, enabled consumers to have access to this product in more locations and further afield from New Zealand exporting. But actually the major food waste outcome is it expanded the processing window for the avocado industry, enabling them to catch more of the crop, recover more of the misshapen and not normally used fruits that otherwise would have been lost on the farm, turn it into a viable product, export it, get great income and reduce food waste in a major way. Thank you. If we move on to, I think that's the end of my slides, thanks. That's fantastic, Alan. Uh, please leave your, your video and, and audio on, please. Because as we move into to question time, I do want to do part of that. And I'd invite Nerida, Michael and Warwick to, to come back online, please, as we, we get into the... We have a few questions. I've, I've noticed a, a number have been asked, but Warwick, you've been particularly busy in answering many of them uh, online. So your expertise in retorting is far greater, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. Knock the questions off, I think, before it comes <laughs> up. <laughs> Well, it, it's great. We're here to attend to the participants' needs, whether we do it verbally like this or by writing. As long as everyone's getting their, their questions answered, that's that's our key role for the next uh, uh, 25 minutes. So thank you each, if you, each of you for your presentations. Uh, I'll now head over to the questions and David was the first one in. He got his question in a long time ago and I've been thinking of it, how to answer it for a long time also. But I'm stumbling, so I'm really seeking assistance. Uh, his question was, what is the impact of nanotechnology in Aussie food packaging? And I must confess, I've had no direct exposure to it. So I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer David's question. So I, I throw it open to the panel. If you, any of you can contribute to uh, David's question. I would think Michael may have some knowledge on that, perhaps. Throw the, throw the, to the technology guy. What a very good question. That's what somebody <laughs> says when they don't have an answer and they're trying to... <laughs> I, I, did, I, I, to come I did say magnificent Michael for a reason, didn't I? Yeah, look, I think um, for, on my very limited knowledge of nanotechnology, um, it's very much uncharted, uncharted waters. I've seen a lot of risk documentation around the, the threat of migration into food products and those sorts of things. So I, I think as an industry, the packaging game has stayed away from it for that reason. Um, short of that, I can't add any more. 
No. Uh, I, Michael, I've seen some really interesting experimental things come out of the United States, particularly in glass jars or, or ketchup bottles where they've, they've coated the inside so that when you pour it, 100% of the product comes out. Uh, but that's been around now for eight or nine years and nobody's taken it commercial. So there's some risks involved, but if they can get it to work, a brilliant concept for fighting food waste by leaving things in, in the packaging. So, David, mm. really good question. I'm sorry we don't have a comprehensive and exact answer. Right, Ralph, I'll, just, I'll just jump in there, just one thought. Um, yep. I, I would recommend to David to contact the, um, it's called APIA, A-I-P-I-A. -I -I. It's the Active and Intelligent um, yep. Packaging Association. They're on the web. Um, I would contact them and because they they will know what's available in that space. Um, if yeah. anyone does AIPIA, -A 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 Yeah, based in the Netherlands for, for memory, but a really active group, good contribute. And while we've got you, Nerida, Ner there's a number of requests that have come by. Can I request a hard copy of the presentation? Could you address that question for us, please? I... I have no um, reason to say no. Um, I believe that all the speakers would be comfortable with us providing that access yeah. to that information. Mm -hmm. So absolutely we'll provide that to Informa and they can send it out, so no problems. Okay. Uh, next question, Alan, I'm going to direct it to, to you. What is the solution of PVDC based high barrier vacuum pouches recyclability which are widely used for meat packaging and dairy product packaging. It's from Jivan. Yeah, really excellent question. Mm -hmm. So PVDC is perhaps one of the standout examples of how you've got that trade-off between circularity and um, performance. It's almost unrivaled in the ability to deliver barrier in trying conditions, particularly because of its uh, capability to function in high moisture environments. Um, I would say that PVDC as a challenge is being tackled from both ends, like a lot of packaging challenges really are. And by both ends, I mean by materials innovation. So redesigning materials to either uh, move to solutions that don't need PVDC or and uh, recycling technologies that can handle uh, various amounts of PVDC. And we see that coming through uh, in, in some areas, particularly in the advanced recycling space. I think that that is quite a challenge and will continue. There is probably more emotional pressure around PVDC than there is around uh, the recognition of the performance it delivers. Uh, so I think that we will see alternatives to PVDC um, filtering into the market more and more. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, in fact, I'll take the next one, which was from, from Gogo. Recycling food containers for reuse, for food use again, is it possible and won't this be costly? Uh, well, I, I spend most of my working life in the food industry and yes, there are some propositions which can work, but hygiene and risk are very dominant features. Um, I really would invite you, Gogo, -Go, to uh, come back on the 22nd of October, where we're having a, a 3 p.m. Bangkok time forum on reusable and refillable packaging designs for the future, which is really going to focus on the question that, that you, you've asked there. So if you can delay it perhaps to, uh, to Thursday afternoon, I think we can have the whole session focused around your question, Gogo. -Go. And we certainly have uh, the general manager of TetraCycle Loop, who'll be one of the presenters at that session. So I think we can really address your, your question there. So thank you very much for that. Hey, Ralph, can I just- Ralph, Jump right just in, Warwick. Yeah, if I, if I just say about the um, recycling of um, food containers. If we look at um, PET bottles, and I know that like Michael touched on recycled PET as well, I think the percentage of food containers to PET bottle is like 1% or 2% or 3%. It's, it's quite, I don't know what the number is, but it's really quite a low number. And I think there's some like 10,000 PET bottles get used every 
10 minutes or every minute in the world or something silly like that anyway. So <laughs> to, to be able to use that, I think it's more important than throwing it away. Oh, clearly, clearly. Uh, one back to you, Alan, uh, regarding your avocado from Dr. Zam. How long would the avocado last after opening the package? Depends on the conditions. Um, so if it's temperature and, and so forth, but yeah, it would be uh, needing to be used fairly, fairly quickly. So typically people using an avocado paste would uh, blend it into a recipe of some kind or use it as a dip. Uh, and it's quite common to add an acid like lemon or lime juice to preserve it for the eating experience. Mm. But it is a, a um, once opened, it is a, a food type that is uh, susceptible. Very. So, you know, it, it would be an eat now experience. It's not something that you would leave in your fridge open uh, for a couple of days. May not be as appealing visually. Oh, no. I did do it for a few years processing avocados, Alan. It's still the most difficult product I've ever touched in the food industry to handle due to its oxidative effects. But a brilliant concept by the Kiwis to maintain the food waste and, and deliver delicious avocados across the supply chain. So that's that's a really good one. Uh, Warwick, next one for you, and you, you sort of touched on this in, in your presentation. Um, Plantic offers both compostable and recyclable solutions. How do consumers choose between these two? I think it's it's um, you know I go back to the packaging has a as a purpose to start off with you know and it's got a function. So we try and um, understand what that fun function is first. Then we we see it's a solution available in the country origin or the area that we're selling that material into and then we try and uh, base our discussion from there okay that's cool but um, i think it's uh, oh. uh, there's so many um variables which they can use both all right uh michael if i can deflect the next one to you so i'm, I'm giving everyone a really good share of it Justine's got a, a really good teasing question. I think it's got you written all over it, by the way. How do you think sustainable packaging addresses the issue on surplus of food supply and how can it minimise food waste? It's a tantalising question. It's a very tantalising question. It's a multi-part question, isn't it? Um, and it's a very long question, so... It, <laughs> Uh, quarter past eight on a on an evening, a guy like me probably struggling with it a little bit. No, look, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole host of uh, Pandora's boxes there. Really, um, pack communication is a is a is a really big thing. Um, <clears throat> giving people the choice and giving people ideas and steering steering consumers in the right direction. Um, there's a whole host of messages there. It's you know I go back to active intelligent packaging scenario there's just so much going on within a, within a food pack the legislative requirements the protection of the food and all those sorts of things when that messaging gets so big how how, how do you how do you keep that fresh um that's where i think that there's a lot of a lot of choices for that i'd throw that that sort of question open to everybody it's a uh, for sure. okay ellen you can go next well, look, no, I just think that um, the front end of the question is sometimes where we're, we're, we've got the blinkers on as to how we think about uh, making questions complex. Uh, in my view, uh, that is the primary function of packaging. You know, how do we deal with uh, an amount of food in a location and get it to, uh, to be used somewhere? That's the primary function of packaging. Storage and distribution, surviving it through a supply chain is absolutely what we're all about. So I think that um, everyone uh, on this call has talked about unique technologies that are out there or within our own companies that enable uh, extension of the usable life of the food. And so it can be moved to where it's needed. That's what we exist to do. I, I think I reinforce it. Alan, one of the slides I used in my presentation was to indicate where does the food waste occur in the whole supply chain. And there were two big columns either, and one was in the household, but the other one was in the paddock. 
And if I could just reflect on Justine's question here, as far as the paddock goes, you really don't want to be leaving any food in the paddock. Uh, the reasons today is either too big, too small, too this or too that, or it doesn't meet a very narrow specification from either retail or whoever's buying it. I think that thinking has to be broadened. And, and then if you're handling something like tomatoes or, or corn and the whatever, you can have your primary crop, but as long as you're recovering all of it and converting it into a means, either by concentration, aseptic packaging, it can even be the old fashioned canning. But each of those products has a value. And then it's really up to those who are buying it to put that, that valued product to work and into a saleable item. Leaving it in the paddock is not the answer. So Justine, there's, there's three different points of view to your questions. It was a great one because it, it teased out uh, really different opinions for, from, from all of us. Uh, okay. I think too, Ralph, we talk yes, about- thanks, Rory. Sorry, we talk about the environmental and different aspects of food wastage. There's also a huge cost. Oh, it's massive. Waste, you know, and that cost on, you know, water and other, other um, resources is huge. And that's, oh, that's look, what yeah. has to be. I think if you go and spend any time with a, with a grower or a farmer, forget what, what the crop is, but you get to understand yeah. what they've invested. And, and it could, could be simply as simply as water, but their own time and energies, there can be fertilizer, nutrition, and a whole range of expenditures there that go into growing that crop. And if it's not utilized, like it. that's, a, that's like certainly unsustainable. And I think Alan touched on it, you know, in his presentation, <laughs> that the shrink bag is, you know, probably one of the best inventions out there for saving food and the cost to the environment to replace the beef that that saves is enormous it's enormous Matt, can i just jump in as well um you know when 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 alan was talking about fresh technologies which is the avocado when you're looking at um the end-to-end -end supply chain solution that is a, the best practice example and currently in all of the award examples, fresh technologies is one that we often use because it starts at the farm and making sure that the avocado was not ploughed back into field because that's where we have to start with food waste. We have to start by making sure it's not ploughed back in the field and, and, and alternatively finding a solution that we can actually transform it. So transforming it into another commercial product. So we have to take it out of ploughing it back in, transforming it, and that could be through a guacamole paste. It could be through a nutraceutical example like bananas. We have a wonderful example of what's happening there up in North Queensland with nutraceuticals. And then looking at, okay, how do we actually then get the packaging involved to improve it all the way through to to the household but then in household what michael was saying which is really critical is getting improved um, on pack communication and actually getting rid of all the noise on pack and just having things like recyclability freezer ready extension shelf life clear and legible date labeling and get rid of all the rest of the noise and 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 put that into interactive and intelligent packaging I'd love to see you get that across a market. As well. <laughs> if there's any marketers out there listening, I apologise. <laughs> uh, well, Michael, no my pictures. experience with them because I, I I share a day with them every day. They are listening. Uh, the the key attribute out of that is is finding a value. Now, whether to which part of the consumer or as a food ingredient to to a second producer, it's make sure it has a value that people are willing to pay for that's fair and reasonable. That's that's really is changing. I, okay, I'm frustrated it's not changing faster, but it is changing. Okay. All right. But, Next. Sorry, yep. sorry, Ralph. Just one one more thing. I do know that's it's okay. actually I do know it's changing in Thailand as well. You know, I've mm -hmm. um, had some communication back from um, my guys up there who have stated um, you know as recently as a couple of weeks ago they're now seeing um, skin packaged meat on the shelves in the supermarket with a 21 day shelf life in thailand where previously the maximum shelf life you could put on um, packaged meat in thailand was five days so even that's a great step forward and a great um, promotion in thailand itself so it's, it's fantastic it's happening everywhere well i, I look for, forward to sharing it with them and having the pleasure of being back in bangkok really soon okay. so yes. tell them from me i'm i'm really envious 
because I miss not being in Bangkok at this time of year. Uh, yeah. There is one question here, which I'll take from uh, Sue Basak, who's asked the question, who can supply PCR polyethylene film, which is safe to be used as food contact materials? Well, I think you're in the right place. You're at ProPAC Asia. In former mm -hmm. Thailand and, and the virtual uh, event that we're having this week, you're in the right place to go and ask all of the right questions. So I'm going to deflect it back to Informer and, and invite you to Basek to investigate. There are many suppliers at this uh, event. Use them, ask them the questions. You'll be amazed at the responses you get from the, the fantastic crowd that we have. Uh, just time for one or two more questions. And Michael, I'm going to pick on you for one of them. In your <laughs> presentation, you spoke about linerless labeling. Yeah. Can you talk just a bit more about the sustainability advantages of them? Well, look, a traditional a traditional self-adhesive label um, is made up of three components, a face stock, an adhesive, and a liner. Um, that liner is made up of two components, um, uh, a carrier, which is either a glassine paper or could be a PET, um, but it has a silicon coating on it. Um, in Australia, we can't recycle that. Um, so it goes straight to landfill. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of change going on with us sending things offshore from Australia. So that, that option gets removed as well. Um, so the technology to be able to remove that component of a self-adhesive product um, is, a, is a pretty big proposition, Ralph. Um, so it's already being used a lot in the, uh, in the protein packaging industry on um, Warwick would be seeing it a lot with um, with Ravenwood for one, um, where it's the, the the liner is gone and um, and yeah next year we 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 launch a, an extension of it in uh, in in case packing so it's it's removing it's removing um, fifty percent of the fifty percent of the waste out of the product basically. Good one, and Ellen, I'm going to give the lucky last one to you before I uh, I hand over to Nerida for for the close. Uh, Alan, your portion packs, isn't it just more packaging for small little individual portion packs? Excellent question. And it really is at the heart of the discussion, mm. balancing circularity and packaging waste versus food waste. So, you know, what do we want more of or less of? Is it, are we going to stand more food waste by having continuing to have bulk packs and sizes of packs that don't suit our households? Or are we going to have right-sized portions of food available uh, and reduce that food waste? Never an easy question because every household's different, every situation's different. Uh, but I firmly believe that it's the right thing to do is to deliver the right amount of food to the occasion where it's needed so that all the food is consumed and a good eating experience is had. That minimizes risk, minimize, uh, maximizes health uh, and, and good eating experiences. What we really have plenty of work to do for us and everyone is working on it hard is how do we build better systems for recovery of packaging and better styles of packaging that have a lower environmental impact in total when, you, when you're rolling out those portion packs. And I think you've seen examples um, from those of us that are directly in the packaging uh, manufacturing industry, from Michael, from Warwick, and from, from myself at Sealed Air, uh, where we have new technologies coming out that reduce the amount of packaging used to deliver those good outcomes, and technologies that either fit with existing recycling systems, or in, uh, in many cases now, development of new recycling systems to give us that opportunity to, to make packaging circular. Great finish, Alan. Thank you so much. And thank you all of the speakers that really have appreciated your involvement tonight and answering all of the questions that have come your way from, uh, from, the, uh, from the participants. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I need to uh, make you aware of tomorrow afternoon, three o'clock uh, Bangkok time, we're having another forum. And this time it'll be on circular and sustainable design. So if I think back to some of the, the images that, that Nerida presented in hers, Michael in his, as well as Warwick and, uh, and Alan, all of it was about creative design, using techniques to both be sustainable 
and maintain that balance of food waste. We're going to go into quite specifics there with Eltra Salia, who's the Vice President of Sustainability from the World Packaging Organization, and a great friend, Pippa Corey, from, uh, she's a, a, a real design guru here in Australia, and she's fantastic, and I think, Ellen, you're going to join us as well. So looking forward to that, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Bangkok time. Now, Nerida, can I hand over to you, please, to, uh, to bring this uh, panel to an end, please? Thank you, Ralph, and thank you to Alan, Michael, and Warwick. Um, I think that was a great conversation, and hopefully everyone that's listening has learned at least one thing that they can take away and apply to their own, either their personal lives or for their business. So I just wanted to um, remind everybody that ProPack Asia has a virtual ex ex exhibition happening right now for all of us that can't be there with you. Um, so please have a look in the chat function. There's a link and you can register and it is available as a virtual exhibition until the 25th. There are a number of exhibitors physically exhibiting in Thailand as we speak and the rest of the world is doing it virtually. So as Ralph said, um, if you have any technical questions or material related questions, jump into either the virtual one or if you can actually get into Thailand, great, wonderful, go, go into the ProPack Asia and actually see some of the exhibition, um, the exhibitors and support them for, 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 for being there and, and trying to keep ProPack Asia going until we all get back together next year. And then I just want to leave you with the final video. I'm always going to play this video and I hope that you will take one thing away from this video. So thank you for joining us and please watch the boss of the World Food Program. He, they won a Nobel Peace Prize for food programs this year and he has a wonderful message that we'd like to share. realize that we're wasting 1.3 billion, not million, billion metric tons of food every year. That's a trillion dollars in value and it could feed 2 billion people. And what's heartbreaking is 690 million people go to bed every night chronically hungry. And on top of that, 135 additional million people literally are marching to the brink of starvation. And now because of COVID, that number is 270 million. And the fact is, and the simple reality is, you and I actually can do something about that. We can stop wasting food. We can eat the food we order. We can take home food from uh, whether it's a restaurant or our leftovers and be creative and, and consume what we purchase. We can make a difference. And if we do, we'll be saving millions of lives around the world. And so together we can make a difference. Fighting to create a song.